All right, here we are again, and uh, today we're going to talk about Lecture 24, uh, and this is going to focus on uh, Texas and the Mexican War. Now, as you remember from the last lecture, we talked about how um, the United States dealt with the quote-unquote Indian problem. Remember, uh, there were certain groups that were standing in the way of, uh, of American expansion. Among them were Native Americans. Well, we also said that the next group uh, that is standing in the way of American expansion is also the uh, Mexicans uh, and the Spanish who, would, who were controlling a large segment of uh, North America. So, um, so let's take a look at, um, at, at what happened as a result of, of this, shall we? Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to analyze the causes and consequences of the Mexican-American War. And this is going to correspond with key concept 5.1.A uh, and B in your AP guide. So, um, so what was going on down in Mexico uh, during this time it was a really fascinating thing. Uh, you have a couple groups that are, um, that are living there in Mexico. Um, first and foremost were, uh, the, um, were the Mexican, uh, were the Spanish-born or Mexican-born uh, Texans, and they were known as Tejanos. Uh, the Tejanos were, were, at least at first, the, the dominant uh, cultural group there, but also up in the north and up in the in western part of Texas was an area known as the Comancheria. Uh, the Comancheria was the territory that that was uh, that belonged to the Comanche tribe, uh, or the Comanche tribes, uh, and the Comanche were not known for being particularly friendly. Uh, they were a, a warrior culture. They were a horse a horse born culture. Uh, they were very famous for uh, for their 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 powerful uh, for their power uh, for conducting raids, especially on uh, on white or uh, on uh, Mexican settlements. And uh, they, were, they had no sense of humor about people coming into their particular territory. This was a huge problem. Uh, so one of the reasons why uh, uh, Mexico is going to, uh, to uh, welcome in Americans is they're, they're getting a little bit weary of all this uh, conflict that they're experiencing with the Comanche. Uh, and, and the Comanche were especially, you know, brave and, and skillful warriors. Um, so they're trying to figure out, well, who would be crazy enough uh, to live on the borderlands with the Comanche? And they went, ah, Americans. So let's invite a bunch of Americans in and let them deal with the Comanche, and we'll create a little buffer zone here, um, you know, between us and the Comancheria. And that's exactly what's going to happen. The, uh, the Mexicans are going to offer uh, land grants to, uh, to Americans. Uh, the uh, land grants, uh, the folks who took these land grants were referred to as empresarios, and probably the largest, well, the first and the largest of these empresarios was the American investor Stephen Austin. Actually, his father, Moses Austin, made the initial investment, um, died, and, and, uh, and, um, and passed on the land grant to his son, Stephen Austin, uh, of Austin, Texas fame. Now, when Americans came into Mexico, they were just, uh, there, there were conditions that were put on uh, American migrants into Mexican lands in Texas. And that was one, you had to become a Mexican citizen. You had to swear your allegiance to the, to the nation of Mexico. And the Americans went, yeah, sure, we'll do that. Fingers crossed. Um, and also, the, the, um, they would have to convert to Roman Catholicism. Now, this was really, really strange. Uh, you know, for these uh, for these Americans to come into uh, into Texas and renounce their citizenship and and uh, renounce their Protestantism, these were two of the main identifying factors of being an American, uh, and they were going to give that up to gain lands in Texas. Yeah, they really weren't going to do that. Um, and later on, uh, the uh, a more centrist government is going to take uh, take control in Mexico, and is also going to uh, not, no longer allow slaves to be brought into to, into Texas, um, which is kind of which is really a problem because many of the uh, people who were moving into Texas were Southerners who were bringing their slaves with them. So now we have a situation in which um, in which we have um, American uh, Protestants with slaves are going to have to renounce their American citizenship, uh, give up their Protestantism and embrace Catholicism, and give up their slaves. Well, needless to say, they didn't do that. Uh, so, uh, so ultimately, Mexican officials are going to go up into, into Texas, and they're going to look around, and they're going to see well, a whole bunch of Protestant churches, a whole bunch of slaves, and, uh, and a whole bunch of people who continue to speak English and follow American, uh, uh, follow American customs, and they're going to say, well, wait a minute. 
uh, you're not following the agreements that we made for you coming into Texas. So uh, we're going to have to start really, really enforcing these laws. And the Texans said, well, yeah, that, that's fine and all, but you know what? We've been fighting Comanches. Do you really think that we're afraid of you? And this is going to create a huge conflict uh, between Mexican authorities and the American immigrants in Texas, and ultimately the Americans in Texas, uh, in alliance with the Tejanos, or the, the, the largely uh, the poorer Tejanos, um, are going to rebel against Mexico. Um, now what will happen is uh, this fellow here, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, that's only a, sh a brief version of his name, um, he is a, he has styled himself as the Napoleon of the West. He wasn't quite that. Um, but, um, so, the, so he was also the president of Mexico at the time, and he decides he's going to go up there, and he is going to, uh, to crush this, uh, this, uh, te, uh, American Teano uprising, and he's going to show them who's boss, right? So he he bring he gets his uh, a huge army together, and he starts massing them up into into Texas. In the meantime, uh, a resistance movement was was being led in Texas by a fellow by the name of Sam Houston. Fascinating fellow. If you get a chance to read um, some biographies about uh, Sam Houston, uh, get take that chance because uh, it, it's a worthwhile story. It's a fascinating fellow. Uh, either way. Um, Sam Houston is going to become the leader of the, the, uh, the Americans uh, and the Teanos uh, who were rebelling. And uh, now, of course, uh, Santa Ana's army is just absolutely huge. I mean, it's an overwhelming force. And, Santa, and Sam Houston's army is relatively small, relatively unsophisticated, but, you know, pretty good fighters overall. Um, ultimately, uh, Santa Ana is going to, uh, to assert himself quite brutally, uh, at first at a place called Goliad, uh, and, then, uh, and then famously a uh, place called the Alamo. Uh, in, at Goliad uh, and at the Alamo, all of the people, uh, all, of the, um, all of the rebels are going to be put to death. They're going to be killed, um, especially at the Alamo. Um, and in the Alamo, of course, we will lose such people as David Bowie. Uh, David Bowie, no, not David Bowie, Jim Bowie. <laughs> David Bowie is a different guy. Um, uh, Jim Bowie, the uh, the guy who invented the Bowie knife for uh, my knife aficionados, and also uh, Davy Crockett, uh, famous Davy Crockett fan uh, fame. Um, <coughs> and um, well, it sure looks like uh, you know when when he, uh, you know Santa Ana has this overwhelming uh, force. Yeah, maybe he can win a couple battles. Uh, so he finally, he gets Sam Houston pretty much backed up against the San Jacinto uh, River. And, um, and he pretty much feels he's got this war wrapped up. He's just got one more battle to go. So he takes his soldiers, he rests them for, for a little while. And Sam Houston uh, and his army attacks uh, Santa Ana at the uh, San Jacinto River. Um, while he's basically sleeping, and they just kind of sneak attack. Uh, and even though Sam Houston it was uh, had less than half the soldiers that uh, that uh, Santa Ana did, uh, Sam Houston's going to win the Battle of San Jacinto and uh, capture uh, Santa Ana, who was hiding in the gr in the tall grass. Uh, they find him, they take him, they drag him to uh, to the tree where Sam Houston is laying under the tree. He has a uh, a, um, a, a a bullet in his leg, and um, and they negotiate, and uh, during in, it, in this negotiation, uh, Santa Ana will agree. Yes, the the Texans uh, can be independent. They are their own country. You win, my bad. Uh, also, and this is very important, Santa Ana agrees that the southern boundary of uh, of Texas is the Rio Grande. Uh, can you remember that? I remember this uh, the, the say the Rio Grande. Okay. Um, but probably the most important thing about uh, this agreement after the Battle of San Jacinto is once this uh, agreement gets down to the Mexican Congress, the Mexican Congress rejects it out of hand. They, they, uh, the Congress refuses to accept the, um, the status of Texas as an independent nation and refuses to accept the southern boundary of, uh, as, uh, as the Rio Grande. Well, this is going to become a huge, huge problem. Um, another problem for Texas is that Texas, 
the intention of Texas always was to, uh, to become part of the United States. And when uh, Texas applies for statehood, uh, they're turned down. And the reason why they're turned down is because, they, uh, because that would have uh, you know, destroyed the balance between southern and northern uh, fr uh, free states and slave states. Bringing Texas into the country as a, uh, as a slave state would have destroyed the balance. And politicians at that time were not willing to disturb that balance. They were not willing to, uh, to, to go there. At least northern... Uh, at least northern politicians were not willing to go there, and this could and uh, and uh, Texas statehood could not get past uh, the Senate. So, um, all right, <coughs> that is of course until 1844. Uh, 1844 is going to be a presidential election year, and it's going to be a contest between Henry Clay, who made a good career of losing presidential elections. And um, uh, James Knox Polk, the uh, the Democrat, um, in this case. So um, now, a lot of this had to do with the concept of manifest destiny. The big debate during this time. There were a couple big debates coming on during this time. Uh, one of them was uh, Texas statehood. A lot of people wanted Texas to become a state, and uh, and and this was this was a huge cont a contest between these two. Uh, James Knox Polk was in fact all for Texas entering in as a state, uh, but Henry Clay refused to really take a position on this. Also, um, another problem was the Oregon Territory. We'll talk about the Oregon Territory in in just a little while. There was a conflict between the United States and Britain over the Oregon Territory. Um, and of course, John, James Knox Polk is also going to take a very hard, uh, a hard line, uh, you know, against the British and the Oregon Territory, wanting to annex all of the Oregon Territory. So we want to bring in Texas. We want to, um, um, we want to annex all of the Oregon Territory, and this seemed to make a difference in the, uh, in this. So uh, James Knox Polk will win the election. But let's take a look at this map. Uh, let me use my little magic pen. Um, oh, let's see here. Um, it's not letting me do what I want it to do. Uh, I can't see the part that I want to see. Hold on. All right, well, it's, it's too close to the edge, and it's not really letting me uh, get a good look here. Well, maybe. Ah, okay. There we go. Uh, what we can see is... That, um, that this is really not, this was a pretty close election. Hold on. Okay, had a little interruption there. But anyway, this election is really, really close. Uh, can, can it be said that it is a mandate? Uh, it's hard to say, uh, an election this close. But it does seem that the idea of Manifest Destiny and the Manifest Destiny stands that James Knox Polk was making did in fact turn the tide uh, of this uh, of this election. At least that's how it was perceived. So then the the question then becomes what to do with Oregon. And actually, um, James Knox Polk was fairly moderate with, with regard to uh, to uh, Oregon. Of course, uh, the consequences of not settling his issues with Oregon meant possibly going to war with England, which was really not a, a pleasant prospect. So uh, the question, of course, was, um, should Americans be able to take all of Oregon, all the way up to the 5440, as many people were supporting uh, the idea of 5440 or fight, or settle with the British and uh, simply allow them to have all of the land above the Columbia River? Well, instead, they came up with a happy medium, choosing instead to draw the line at the 49th parallel and calling it cool, resolving the Oregon uh, conflict and officially making uh, the Oregon, at least the southern half of the Oregon Territory, a part of the United States. Um, moving along. Uh, now, um, in 1845, as a last-ditch effort to try to, uh, to, try to appeal to... Uh, to um, uh, try to win the election for the uh, for the Whigs. Uh, President Tyler 
did ultimately agree to, uh, to bring Texas in as a state. Yeah, the damage was already done. So in 1845, though, Texas does enter into the United States as a state. And this is going to cause huge problems with Mexico. Of course, the government of Mexico never recognized the validity of Texas being an independent uh, nation, and they therefore is really going to be upset with the United States annexing this territory. They still consider this to be part of Mexico. Um, what's more is we're going to add to this a little bit. Um, remember, according to the, uh, the treaty by Santa Ana, or at least the agreement by Santa Ana, the southern boundary of Texas was the Rio Grande, this part here. But according to, uh, of course, Mexico never accepted that treaty, so they're saying that the southern boundary of Texas is the Nueces River, this section here. Well, it turns out if you actually, um, if you actually extend this, then what you're looking at is a really big chunk of real estate that's, that's in, in question here. So, of course, there's a boundary dispute between the United States and Mexico as to where the southern part of, of, uh, te of Texas is. Um, and a lot of things are going to be set in motion now. The reality is, is that James Knox Polk was interested in Texas, of course, but was also interested in California. He had sent his, uh, his guy down there um, to, uh, he had made an offer to purchase uh, the New Mexico Territory in California from, uh, from Mexico. The Spanish wouldn't even uh, have anything to do with that. Um, so, you know, among the things that he did was he sent the, uh, the um, famous uh, uh, adventurer John C. Fremont to California to kind of, uh, you know, get a situation going where, uh, where they could maybe take California. James Knox Polk wanted California. It was a really great chunk of real estate, some good agricultural lands, and excellent ports on the Pacific with which to extend our markets into the Pacific Ocean, namely uh, doing business with China. Um, so Fremont is sent into California, and uh, while John C. Fremont is in California, he kind of sets the stage for a little uh, rebellion among uh, the few Americans that were there. And uh, these American businessmen and these Americans, uh, American settlers in California will rise up and declare uh, California to be an independent, uh, an independent country called the Bear Flag Republic. Um, in the meantime, General Zachary Taylor is going to be sent down into Texas, to protect um, American interests in Texas, so he's going to bring his his uh, army down into the um, into up to the Nueces River, all right. And in this, in the meantime, um, the uh, American ambassador John Slidell is going to be sent down to um, to Mexico to offer to settle this whole thing, just buy all the territory we want. And um, Mexico isn't even going to let him in the room. They're not even going to open the door to him. They com completely rebuff uh, John Slidell. And once that happens, once it becomes clear that Mexico is not willing to negotiate over these lands and not willing to sell these lands, then uh, James Polk orders Taylor to bring his army down to the Rio Grande. Now, this is a problem. Now, this is almost universally recognized by Mexicans as Mexico. So, in essence, as from the Mexican perspective, Zachary Taylor's army is an invading army. Um, according to the American perspective, the, the southern boundary is the Rio Grande, and Zachary Taylor is down there in order to protect American interests on the uh, north of the Rio Grande. Um, uh, well, the reality is, is that Zachary Taylor is there to start trouble. He's there to, to, to get a fight started um, and without the United States actually being the aggressor. Um, and it'll work. What will ultimately happen is Zachary Taylor is going to be down there on the Rio Grande uh, for, a, for a while. Uh, Mexico restrains itself and doesn't respond to this. But will ultimately there will be a skirmish between the the Americans and actually a um, a, um, a patrol on the Rio Grande is going to get, get attacked by Mexicans and uh, about 16 Americans are going to be killed and then that gives Z uh, James Knox Polk the opportunity to go to go to Congress and say American soldiers have been killed on American soil and we need to do so we can't let that happen we need a declaration of war. Um, well, James Knox Polk will get his declaration of war, uh, but there is some dissent. dissent. Uh, some of the, uh, their main part, uh, dissent is going to come from a fellow by the name you may have heard of, uh, a, uh, a, a freshman representative from Illinois by the name of Abraham Lincoln. 
uh, he is going to uh, enter a bunch of spot, re what are called spot revolutions, in which he asks, show me the spot where American blood has been spilled on American soil. This is not a given here. Uh, this was contested land. This is, we don't necessarily know that this is legally American soil. Uh, these were known as the spot resolutions, and Abraham Lincoln at that point gets the nickname Spotty Lincoln. Um, well, during this time, of course, there's a multi-tier strategy that's going to go on. This is a huge chunk of real estate to, uh, to conquer. Um, General Stephen Kearney is going to be sent to reinforce Charles C. Fremont in California and, uh, and to take the New Mexico Territory, which he does relatively easily. Santa Fe um, surrenders to Kearney uh, without resistance. <coughs> and within relatively uh, short order, uh, the naval blockade that had already been established around California uh, and uh, General Kearney are going to take California relatively quickly. Uh, General Zachary Taylor is going to be uh, is going to move from his position on the Rio Grande and head down to New Mexico. Um, I'm sorry, to Mexico City, and um, uh, he's going to uh, you know uh, have a major victory in. Buena Vista, uh, and he's going to start making his way down to Mexico City. He is expected to meet up with General Winfield Scott, um, who is going to make a landing in Veracruz and win a brilliant victory of Veracruz. Um, but then it's going to be a matter of these armies just slogging through uh, some really, really, uh, you know, aggressive and assertive uh, defenses in Mexico. Um, and... Um, Ultimately, they will end up get, getting to Mexico City, so uh, and they will take the city. It'll take them about six months, and it'll be really, really brutal fighting um, to do that. And also, uh, a significant number of American soldiers are going to be lost as a result of disease, dysentery. Um, and ultimately, once the United States takes Mexico City, the capital of Mexico, uh, there's really nothing more to do except to sign a treaty, a very relatively harsh treaty called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, pretty much said, all right, you know what, all of the northern territories of Mexico are now part of the United States. So, um, so that meant that, um, that Mexico was going to give up any claims to Texas. It was going to give up any claims to the New Mexico Territory, which included modern-day uh, Arizona. Um, Colorado, Utah, uh, New Mexico, and also California. Um, it was going to establish the southern boundary of Texas at the Rio Grande, and, and the United States had agreed to pay $15 million dollars um, in return for all of this land, and to forgive about $2 million in reparations that, the, uh, that Americans were suing against the, uh, the state of the, the nation of Mexico, uh, which comes to about $17 million, right? So, uh, so this was the treaty, and as you can see, um, basically Mexico is going to lose half of its territory, and the United States is going to gain all of that real estate. It's a huge, huge chunk of real estate. Uh, for the record, this, may, this means that James Knox Polk, uh, by himself, within just a span of, t of a couple of years, is not quite going to double the size of the country, but he's going to add something like one and a half million square miles of, uh, uh, of territory to the country. Uh, again, not quite doubling it, but pretty gosh darn close. And he's going to become uh, the, the, the president who adds the most land to the country through military conquest. Uh, no, nobody else has ever done, no other American is going to come close to that, <laughs> to that record. Um, now, during this time, there was some dissent with regard to, and there was some debate with regard to the, uh, to the Mexican War. Uh, famously, the, uh, the, fam the uh, philosopher Hen and naturalist Henry David Thoreau is going to refuse to participate. And uh, one of the things that he's going to do is he's going to protest the war by refusing to pay a, pay, pay a tax and pay taxes to this war. Uh, he, uh, he says that he's not going to pay taxes to, one, a war that he doesn't believe in, uh, and a war that is ultimately there to extend slavery, which is a cause he does not believe in. Um, and it was, it's going to be Henry David Thoreau's uh, position that it is a citizen's responsibility to disobey bad and wicked laws. Uh, he will write this in a, uh, in a tremendous essay called Civil Disobedience. Um, very good, worthwhile reading. Uh, we will also see that uh, there's some dissent among the U.S. military. In fact, an Irish um, battalion 
uh, from Winfield Scott's military is actually going to uh, switch sides. This is going to join the Mexican army, uh, largely as a result of some of the, th some of the uh, atrocities that they saw uh, being perpetrated by Americans on Mexicans. Uh, this group will be called, uh, become the San Patricio Battalion or the Battalion of St. Patrick. Uh, and they will be a, a military group that's simply going to switch sides. And one of the things even uh, Winfield Scott himself had to admit um, uh, that his, uh, his soldiers, as a result of the, some of the brutal fighting uh, that they encountered on their way to Mexico City, can, tended to take out their aggression on the Mexican citizens. Um, he said that U.S. soldiers committed atrocities to make heaven weep and every American of Christian morals blush for his country. Uh, these are things that happened during wars. Um, there was also a, a move uh, that was upset about the, uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. As, as lopsided as the treaty was, there were many Americans who said, hey, why don't we just take all of Mexico? We won the war. We got the capital city. Game over. We have all of Mexico. Um, this was, of course, opposed by northern Whigs, uh, who felt that taking all of Mexico meant overextending slavery. Uh, so there was an anti-slavery argument from, uh, against the idea of taking all of Mexico. <coughs> but there was also a, a southern argument against taking all of Mexico, one presented by John C. Calhoun himself. And we would expect that John C. Calhoun would be in favor of taking all of Mexico. But... He wasn't. In fact, John C. Calhoun was a little bit concerned that if you took all of Mexico, that it would be impossible to rule Mexico, Mexicans as a conquered people. That, in fact, what you would have to do is incorporate the Mexicans into the United States as the, uh, the people of Louisiana had been incorporated into the United States, or at least the European, the French people of Louisiana had been incorporated into the, uh, into the United States. And uh, John C. Calhoun... Um, didn't think that was possible, didn't think that it was a good idea to bring the dark-skinned, um, um, you know, Mexicans into the United States as equals, so, you know, so the Southern argument was largely based on good old-fashioned racism. Uh, also, too, significant about this particular war is that this is really uh, going to be the, the first war in which uh, the press itself isn't going to be dependent upon the politicians who are promoting the war to give them their rationale for the war. Um, there's a couple of innovations. One is the telegraph. The telegraph is going to allow for instantaneous communication. Uh, and, and information about the war, and, and citizens could stay in touch with what was going on with regard to this particular war uh, by simply reading the press. Um, and also, because of that, uh, newspapers are going to send reporters down to report on the war directly, rather than try to get news briefings from, uh, from the president or from the, uh, from the White House. So they're going to send that, the, their, um, their journalists down, and these will be the very first war correspondents. Uh, reporting on what was going on during this war. So, uh, so this was a hugely uh, uh, different kind of situation, as we can kind of see in this, in this image of uh, folks who are, you know, getting their news uh, about this war and, and how we're kind of coming together as a community. We even are, see, uh, see African Americans waiting and listening in on news from the, uh, from the war. So, um, but either way, the Mexican-American War is going to transform the United States, not just physically, but also, uh, you know, also with regard to its character. And to a certain extent, uh, folks like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who were concerned that extending American possessions into, uh, into Mexico was going to be kind of a poison pill uh, for the United States, uh, they, they proved to be largely correct. Um, the territory that we, uh, that we acquire as a result of the Mexican-American War are going to become a source of conflict that's going to lead directly to um, the Civil War. So we'll talk about that later on.